Welcome to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast, where green practices meet profitable solutions. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in eco-friendly hospitality that not only safeguard our planet, but also drive down operating costs and boost revenue. Every week, we will bring you compelling conversations with industry leaders who are at the forefront of merging sustainability with economic success. Whether you're a hotelier, a resort manager, or a passionate traveler, this is your gateway to the future of sustainable hospitality. Tune in and let's explore how going green is good for both the earth and your bottom line. We're your hosts, Amy Wald, and Kathy McGuire. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. I'm Amy Wald, one of your hosts. And as I sit here today in a nine degree weather day in Columbus, Ohio, I am warmed up and really, really excited to have Costas Christ with us today. Thank you, Costas, for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, Amy, and thank you, and uh, greetings to all your listeners. Yes, this is going to be an exciting episode because, you know, you are a pioneer uh, in this um, movement. You're really kind of the godfather, I mean, I would like to say. And just to give our audience some background and some of the incredible accomplishments you have had, uh, you served as a National Geographic Senior Advisor for Sustainability, helped establish the United Nations Global Sustainable Tourism Criteria, award-winning author, NBC News said, for the past 30 years, Costas has been at the leading edge of the green travel movement since way before it was ever called green or even a movement. Um, Costas, you sparked a global movement to transform the tourism industry, including helping to officially define the principles of ecotourism as responsible travel to natural areas that protect nature and sustains the well-being of local people. Your travels have taken you to more than 140 countries across six continents, and your life's work has been featured into two award-winning films, including the 2022 feature documentary, The Last Tourist. And if you haven't watched that, for those of you listening, you need to put it on your to-do list. He has served as a strategic advisor advisor to heads of state, travel corporations, conservation organizations, and nonprofit associations, connecting tourism to the protection of natural and cultural heritage and community-based economic development. In 2023, Costas was inducted as a fellow of the Explorers Club, which was founded in 1904. Joining a roster of some of the most renowned explorers in the world, including Sir Edmund Hillary, Jacques Cousteau, Buzz Aldrin, and Amelia Earhart. And Costas, you were also honored together with the legendary conservationist, Dr. Jane Goodall, celebrated oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, and philanthropist and conservationist, Ted Turner, for his life's work to save the planet. Um, we could go on and on, but the la- one last thing I want to mention is Costas is the co-founder of the Blue Climate Initiative. I can't wait to talk about this. Um, this brings together innovators, community leaders, scientists, and global experts through evidence-based action to address climate change. And we're going to talk about how we, we can merge those two things together and really create visions and strategies to tackle um, these, these huge wicked problems that we have, but doing it through travel and tourism. So thank you so much. Um, tell us, Costas, gosh, You know, when everyone else was out there just traveling and just taking in our beautiful world and planet, what were you seeing uh, that really helped you start to formulate these ideas, get behind this movement, start this movement, and really help set standards in our industry? Well, uh, thank you. That's quite a lovely uh, introduction. Sometimes I sit here and I'm like, who is that person? (laughs) You know, but thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I never set out 
to get involved with tourism. Uh, it wasn't uh, really on my radar. The truth is I had experience because I grew up on a barrier island off the coast of southern New Jersey. So in the summers, you know, it would be inundated with tourists. And then in the winters, it would be like a ghost town. And all of us, one way or another, made our livelihood from tourists. And, you know, the, the endless jokes of, you know, joking about tourists or making fun of them when you're a teenager and such. And yet they were literally what was putting bread on your table. It was what was paying the bills. So in an indirect way, I had a an early exposure to tourism, uh, but I had no interest in it, to be honest with you. Um, I really was a nature kid. I want I love nature and I wanted to get out in nature. My ambition, uh, and I could think of nothing better than one day becoming a park ranger. I wanted to wear one of those Smokey the Bear hats, you know. So that was all my passion. Um, but I was, you know, fortunate enough um, with the assistance of a, a nice guidance counselor in school who pulled me aside one day and said, you know, hey, you know, we we would we got to get you into college. Let's talk about this. I see you. You like nature. You're always cutting classes and getting in trouble because you're running out in the woods and stuff. And let's see if we can channel this in a positive direction. So um, here's the key answer to your question. Um, I was in my sophomore year at university in college. I had been very fortunate in getting accepted on an overseas program in the country of Kenya to do a study of monkeys, vervet monkeys, a primate study. Now, this was my dream come true, wildlife ecology. I would live in a place in Africa, I'd sleep in a tent, and I would just follow animals around, in this case, monkeys. What I wasn't prepared for was what I encountered. And that was the trajectory that really changed things. Over, first of all, um, I underestimated how lonely it can get when you're way out in the middle of nowhere and you're 21 years old. There was one head of the project that came and went. Uh, this was a project that was sponsored by Harvard University. I was a research assistant. And, um, <clears throat> and so starved for social life. Think of it, you're 20, 21 years old, you know, it's, it's, you know, I gravitated and learned enough of the local language that I was able to begin to strike up friendships with my age mates who were in the indigenous community, a group called the Sambudu in Kenya, cousins of the Maasai. And I heard them talk really negatively about the national park they were in. And I didn't get it. Like, how can anybody be against nature? Like, what? how could you be against a park? You know, it's like, I just didn't get it, you know? Meanwhile, the work I was doing in the park was through the blessings of the park warden and the national park authorities in Kenya. And they talk constantly about the problem with the local people. That was the issue, it was the problem. They incur, they come into the park, they do this and that. So local people talking about the problem of this park, the park authorities talking about the local people as the big problem they were facing. And yet in this park were some of the rarest animals on the planet. Somali blue neck ostrich found only north of the equator. You know, we know rhinos, black rhinos, critically endangered species, et cetera, among others. And over the course of two years, this tension that I mentioned, you know, local people despising this park, park authorities angry and pushing against local people, basically reached a literal combustible situation. In the middle of this, whole park was one tourist lodge. And it was owned by somebody in the UK. And it was like a cash machine. At the time in Kenya, there wasn't a lot of other competition for safaris. So every day it was like a cash machine, ka-ching, ka-ching. Somebody was making a massive amount of money, yet local women were walking 18 kilometers to get water, living in abject poverty on land that was once theirs. And park authorities were battling them. And this tension reached the point where the locals attempted to burn down the tourism lodge in anger. 
And I was, like I said, I was very young uh, at the time, at least in my view, early 20s. Um, I just was stunned. I was called on. We helped put this fire down. What would what would cause this level of an animosity like that this could reach a position of torching a lodge? So that experience jarred me and set me thinking a lot of quiet, lonely nights around a campfire uh, during the course of this uh, primate study, thinking that there was something fundamentally wrong with conservation and could tourism actually be not the problem, but the solution? And that was the beginning of the journey that I began thinking, what if there was a way in which tourism actually partnered with local people? What if local people were the primary beneficiaries in this area? What if tourism actually contributed to the protection of the very things tourists were coming to see, wildlife, beautiful landscapes, et cetera? So that was the beginning of the journey. And I will now date myself because, <laughs> because what we are talking about is the very early 1980s. And so I spent uh, the 1980s basically pursuing this concept of a different type of tourism, a new tourism, a tourism that would embrace conservation and poverty alleviation, that would work in partnership with local people. And it was in its infancy, it was a hard sell. Now, I know, Amy, you, you work with and you're uh, with the hospitality sector, for example. And I began knocking on those doors and tour operators and others. And here's what I was told in the 80s. You seem like a nice young man. Um, if you want to save wildlife, why are you talking to us? We own hotels. Like if you want to help people get clean drinking water or poverty, you should talk to, you know, uh, one of the mission groups or go to the UN. Uh, development agency, you want to save animals, talk to World Wildlife Fund. We're businessmen. We put heads in beds. We're not your audience. And thank you and have a nice day and, and wish you good luck. And basically door after door was shut in my face until I realized that the ethical argument, which is we should save the planet. We should think about our grandchildren you know, um, wasn't moving the dial. So I began to do something that in the beginning actually caused some ruckus in the conservation community, which I aligned myself with, which was began making a business case argument. And some actually pushed back saying, and I can give you a very good example of that, uh, that had to do with the Mountain Gorilla Project at the time, Diane Fossey was still alive. And I had an opportunity to meet with her, you know, and her view I agreed with, but I was worried it wasn't gonna work, which was this, gorillas have just as much a right on this planet to exist as you and I. They don't have to perform, they don't have to earn their keep, they don't have to earn their place to be in this world. They don't have to be part of tourism. And I agree, it's just that here was an industry growing at a phenomenal rate. And I began to think it was either going to destroy or become a catalyst for protecting places and benefiting local people. That's a long answer to what got me started, but that was the trajectory of the journey that kind of led me away from being a field biologist and embracing at the time what I was calling conservation sociology, for lack of a better term. How do we make this work? And could tourism actually be the answer and not just the problem? Wow. Talk about a light bulb moment. I mean, really. And, you know, I feel silly sitting here because honestly, and I say this a lot, I I want people to be the byproduct of this. But my my mo main motivator is conservation, is animals. Um, and 
silly. I thought I started this, Costas. I'm just kidding. I know I did it, but I am so thankful for you laying the, that groundwork. And you know, the 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 concept of human wildlife conflict, right? It, it, when you talk about places like Africa, Indonesia, these faraway places, that is such a common concept. And we've been able to now with help from people like you work through those. But you know, honestly, even in the United States, there is that as well. It just presents itself differently. Oh, yes, um, you are correct. And it's, it, you know, we need more education on that here here in, in the United States for people to be able to make that connection too. But that's a whole nother conversation, right? Um, so, you know, you were in the travel industry. So had you, you made that transition into the travel industry, right? And well, I'll give you an example. Okay. Okay. Through the 80s, I began connecting with other people who were having similar thinking at the time in different parts of the world. Uh, less than a dozen of us, to be honest. And we're working in isolation. And in southern India, there was a man named Partha Sarathi who was having similar thoughts. In Kenya, there was a guy named David Western who is having similar thoughts in Costa Rica. Most people think ecotourism started in Costa Rica. It didn't. That's a different story. But there was also early concepts of this. In That was in the 80s. In 1990, we gathered as a group. There were 11 of us to try and codify this concept into something tangible that we could go to the travel industry and kind of make a case. So we were like, the argument was this, that I was beginning to make was to the industry, there is going to be a traveler coming, an environmental traveler. They will be the environmental traveler. These issues are gonna to matter to them. They will actually begin to buy products and choose trips based on this. And if you're a smart business person, you should get out ahead of this. Now, when I pitched that, I got the following, which was, this was the 1980s. Environmentalists were chaining themselves to trees in Oregon, laying in front of bulldozers. So the term environmental was associated with like extremism for a lot of business people. So it was like, no, we don't, we don't want those traps. We don't want that kind of person. Aren't they the ones, you know, like laying in front of bulldozers? No, 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 no. We're not interested in that. They they only want to pay $10 a night and they walk around in Birkenstocks and that's not our market. We want the people with the money. You know, that's kind of, I got that. So the term environmental tourist wasn't sticking. So the 12 of us, 11 of us gathered actually in a farmhouse outside of DC and people flew in from each of the continents. And we started saying, okay, we're getting pushback on this thing. We got to come up with some other name, another way to make this easily grasped. So one person said, well, let's just call it biological tourism. And it's like, no, no, no. It sounds like you got to get a degree, like to go on a trip, you know, like, you know, like you want a vacation, get a degree first, you know? No, no, no. Okay. Biotourism. No, it sounds like bioterrorism. It's the same problem, you know. Ecological tourism. Oh, that this rolls off the tongue rough, you know. Okay. Put my hand up. How about just ecotourism? Hmm. Ecotourism. Maybe that could be it. How do we define it? What is it? We can't write a book about it. We need one sense. We need something that can grasp quickly. You read in your intro what we came up with. It took us two days. Ecotourism, responsible travel to natural areas that protects nature and sustains the well-being of local people. We got it. We got the term. What we didn't know and what I certainly didn't know in May of 1990, pre-social media and the rest of it in its infancy, was it was about to go viral. And it went viral as a concept beyond what we could even imagine. I was running around the world. Australia became the first country, 1993, and invested $10 million to develop a plan around this. 
I was setting up like ecotourism chapters in all these places. So that was that was the kind of gist of how that happened. And for the sake of our conversation to follow, I'm going to just, and I promise all my answers won't be this long. I will jump to another key point because I think this is going to open the door for some of the conversation you would like to have. And that is, so that was the 1990s, okay? This concept of ecotourism just went all over the world. I was asked to address the UN General Assembly. You know, I was flying here and there, talking with all these different organizations. And then the United Nations, for the first time in history, dedicated a year. Now, up to this point, the UN is always the International United Nations International Year of the Child, the International Year of Clean Drinking Water, the International Year of Women, and so on, declared in 2002 the International Year of Ecotourism. This was a big moment. And then the UN held the first United Nations Global Summit to discuss this issue in Quebec City. Canada, in the old city, people poured in from all around the world. It's UN, so delegates and indigenous groups and, you know, ministers and all of this stuff. And of course, I was there to also give an opening speech and so on. And I did. And that night went back to the hotel and woke up in the middle of the night with a kind of hybrid panic attack and epiphany simultaneously <laughs> and it was the following oh my god what if we got this all wrong what if this whole thing isn't based on a solid foundation what did i mean i thought to myself right now at this point in time in 2002 we had we were just about to hit a billion international travelers the and ecotourism represented at best 22% of the global tourism industry. Well, what about the other 78%? Like, what if we're just scratching the surface? This industry is growing so big. We, we, we narrowed our focus too much. What about cruise ships? What about the airline industry? What about all-inclusive resorts? What about city hotels? You know, wait a minute. Why should this concept of responsible travel be restricted to a Costa Rican jungle lodge and an African safari camp? What about Hilton and Hyatt? What about all of the above? How about the entire global industry in every manifestation of tourism? That was the epiphany part. So I literally dropped out of conferences and organizations that I helped found focused on driving ecotourism and began talking about a concept of sustainable tourism, whereas ecotourism was always about nature, a trip in some way that you were experiencing nature. Where ecotourism stops at nature, sustainable tourism takes the same concepts and brings them into the entire global industry based on three key pillars environmentally friendly practices, reduce, reuse, recycle, so on and so forth, support for the protection of cultural and natural heritage, and social and economic well-being of local people. So bring this into the mainstream of the industry, and that's when things really started to, you know, that's when it got into a major global initiative with all of its pros, cons, and complications. But I will add this final point. We're actually more further along than I would have predicted 15 years ago. That's the positive. I don't think we're further enough along. But the industry hasn't embraced it to an extent that I didn't anticipate, uh, anticipate based on the pushback I got early on. So that's kind of brings us to the world today of an idea from a campfire, an idea of ecotourism, and wait a minute, why should the industry get a free pass? 
if tourism distilled to its essence, Amy, and this is true, what does tourism sell? If we just stop for a minute and think about it, what is it that we sell? This industry. Basically, if you distill it down to its essence, it's two things. It's nature and culture. We dress it up with rooms with a view and great service and a wonderful bottle of Zinfandel over a sunset cruise and all these things. But as I said at the time to the president of Four Seasons, do you really think people are flying to the Serengeti to sit on your veranda and have a gin and tonic and watch the sunset? No. They're flying to the Serengeti to sit on the Four Seasons veranda at the time. Now it's a Kapinski. Four Seasons and have a gin and tonic and look at a sunset when the world's last major land migration of wildlife is happening in front of them. Your lodge and your service complements that show. You are not the show. And if that's the case, what are you doing to invest in protecting the very thing that basically in your business terminology is your product? Because if you have no product, you're out of business. It was tough to make that connection. Literally gives me goosebumps. I would have loved to have been a little <laughs> fly on the wall in those conversations. And the and what is so amazing is you look at the state of the market today and you talk about those hotels that you were speaking to at the time, where now there are brands like One Hotel, like Six Senses, like Soneva, like Kapinski, that are charging high, high dollar around the value proposition of taking care of nature, protecting the places they're at protecting the people that are there and the local culture. So it's it has really come light years. But like you said, I think, does it feel like to you we made, you know, a lot of progress in a short amount of time, for instance, over the past five years? Or does it feel like it was stretched out over the past, you know, 30 years or so? It's been a a kind of slow burn over 30 years with spurts of significant advancement. You mentioned, uh, you know, one and only. In 2004, Barry Sternlich came and heard us, uh, came to hear me give a speech. 2005, he came back and heard me again. Walked over to me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, I heard you last time and I heard you this time. I want to get behind this somehow. He launched One Hotels not long after that. And hats off to him because he, he did it at an early stage. To your, um, to your question, you know, in a way, I'm more frustrated today than I was five years ago. Uh, because I'll be honest with you, Amy, I'm beginning to see, not even beginning, I'm starting, uh, I'm seeing a greenwashing backlash in another level. You know, we went out of the gate with these concepts. And one of the first things was, you know, well, how do we police it? You know, like who we can say all we want, but how do we know who's doing what? Like, you know, how's the traveler going to have confidence? We don't have to get into certification right now because I'm a mixed viewer of that. But my point is, ultimately, at that time, this was going back to that room in 1990 with the 12 of us where that came up was really our job's going to have to be twofold to educate the media and educate the traveler. Because at the end of the day, it's the traveler that's going to have to hold to account the business. That's really going to be the most important aspect of it. Um, over the last 30 years, we've made some dramatic steps forward and then slid back made some more steps forward. Right now, we are in a dual period from my perspective in which very significant accomplishments are being made. Entire brands are being established based on this concept. 
Uh, National Geographic launched the brand. Uh, there's a brand called Beyond Green, which you've heard about. So this is great. This is like, yes, this is what we need. And there are others, okay? It's, it's becoming normalized and that's the way it should be. But I'm also beginning to witness a more sophisticated level of greenwashing. Uh, as businesses kind of go out with lofty statements and then, you know, we fall short of it. My message to those businesses today, where I speak in front of an audience of CEOs or others, is the following. You are much better going out talking about limited accomplishments you have than trying to exaggerate what you're doing. And then I give them a case study that's now over 15 years old from the early days. The Little Nell Hotel in Aspen, Colorado, which we're doing really great sustainability stuff. But the marketing teams and others just kind of got a little ahead of themselves. And at the time, a writer from Business Week magazine visited the property and decided to look closer. They appeared on the cover of the magazine under the bold headline, Little Green Lies. And it took, I know this now, you know, at the time I was talking with them and they had a sustainability director. They were early in the game. It was like, yes, you guys are doing stuff. You don't need to exaggerate. They said, oh my God, how do we get out of this? I said, well, own up to it. And they said, what? So what did they do? I mean, hats off. Talk about marketing knowledge and, you know, what do they call it? Crisis control or something like that in public relations. Well, their sustainability director decided to write a book about their experience, and it was called Getting Green Done, Hard Truths from the Front Lines of the Sustainability Revolution, and then went on a book tour talking about a case study of what they did, how it went wrong, and so they owned it, and that actually was a positive for them mm -hmm. and got them out of that rather than trying to argue or pretend. So my point is to any of your listeners out there that are hotels or travel industry people or tour operators, you should constantly look how you can advance yourself on the sustainability front, because as Amy knows and others know, this is the future of travel. And you don't have to exaggerate. You're in a stronger position talking about what you're doing well and what you hope to accomplish next than trying to say you're doing more than you are. I I'm so glad you said that because I'm such a believer in start small and do it well, get that accomplishment, get those wins and build on it. I think it's more important to actually have a strategic plan and know where you're going than to go out and just, you know, willy nilly, as they say, and not really be accomplishing anything and telling people you are. So I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Well, let's let's cover a couple of more things for the sake of time. <laughs> go ahead. I know we have a uh, somewhat tight schedule, but do, well, I'll go. Do. I'll go further because I'm the one who started talking, uh, <laughs> and hopefully not keeping you from other questions. Absolutely not. Where so, <clears throat> you know, where do you see when it comes to sustainability that leaders should be focused right now? Um, you know, I, I believe that. And and please tell me you're you are the expert. I really think it's a um a really good practice to kind of look in your local area. What what is materiality, you know, material to your business? What effects are you having on a local um basis? And maybe start to formulate your plan that way. How would you um how do you see the industry needing to tackle things? Well, you know, there's a there's a lot in that statement, but if I were talking to a property that was just kind of beginning uh, or a company that was kind of like wanting to get in on this, um, there would be a couple of things that I tell them right up front. One, they should not put their sustainability initiative in their marketing department. 
They should have it as part of their corporate structure and that sustainability should actually be embedded in their mission statement for one. That's like, yes, the first thing we have to do is have a mission and then we work to accomplish uh, that. And I think that that's very important. By the way, um, it's been some years now, but I believe if I remember correctly, it was Focus Right, oh no, or it might've been Accenture. When, you know, a decade ago, when I'm running around talking about this, making a business case, Accenture said, okay, let's, you know, let's put this to the test because we're all about where the money is, you know, follow the money. Where's the money? Is there truly a business case to be made? And they uh, took uh, the Forbes 500 list, distilled the travel companies out of that divided them into those that had embedded sustainability into their corporate structure, as opposed to like an add-on or marketing or whatever, meaning into the fiber, the fabric, the DNA of a company, and compared those with those that didn't. I was incredibly excited about the study because I wanted to see the results, you know. I thought, my God, if they come back and say 40% of businesses that did this, I am going to grab that statistic and run with it. It was 100%. Every single business that had embedded sustainability in their corporate structure outperformed their competitors that did not by a margin of uh, 6 to 16%. So... For all those CEOs out there, I'd be saying, who among you wouldn't want to grow your business annually by 6 to 16% and outperform perform your competitors, if not more? And that study is about a decade ago, and I would argue it's more today. That so is, that would be one thing. Yeah. It would be embed this. Then, the you know, the first thing I would simply say also to immediately build your credibility Get rid of your plastic water bottles on property. Now, I know it's like, oh, God, another person talking about plastic straws or whatever. The fact of the matter is there is really no reason that a hotel any longer needs to have plastic water bottles. So then the question is, yes, but our guests this, our guests that. Well, we have a, a responsibility to educate the guests. But here's my point. Any hotel, I th take the Savoy in London, okay, where I have worked with. You can go out and for fifty thousand dollars, thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars, buy a self-watering, a self-bottling recyclable water plant, brand it with your hotel's name. Take the Jefferson in Washington D.C., one of the top luxury hotels in that city and in the country. Their problem was not getting rid of plastic water bottles. Their problem was guests wanting to keep the bottles with their names engraved on them that they found in the room, just like with, you know, bed robes, that they had to say, if you like this beautiful bottle, it's for sale in our gift shop and you can take it home. So my point, another piece of this, it takes, depending on the property and the size, easily two, maybe three years to sell that investment back. What do I mean? To get the investment back on putting your own self-bottling plant, which by the way, sounds big, but it can fit into a closet. I've seen a hundred room hotel with a self-bottling plant within the size of a, a literally a bedroom closet. So my point is that's a powerful statement for a property to be able to be made. So when I say get your investment back, what do I mean by that? And I'll tell you what hotels are doing, groups like Six Senses and others. What they're doing is, it's up to the hotel, really. Some hotels just make their water complimentary. And that's just what they want to do. It's their gig. It's up to them. They charge the rates they want. Other hotels have two complimentary bottles on arrival in your guest room or just in the room will replace those complimentary bottles but anywhere else in the hotel, like, like sparkling water, which, by the way, they can make right there, or bottled water, you know, for the table, they can either give it to them for free or sell it to them. And a lot of hotels sell that for $5 a bottle. So my point is, 
you can do something like that, which will immediately separate you from the mass majority of hotels. So embed sustainability in your corporate structure and tackle plastic water bottles on property. And then after that, you can continue to work forward with other and other things. The uh, Post Ranch Inn in California, a spectacular celebrated luxury property. He has eliminated all plastic in there. He started with the water bottles like we're talking about. And he's ended now with tea bags, you know, and alternative little glass containers that seal that are reusable for in-room nuts and, you know, snacks and potato chips and things like this. Cookies. The guests love it. So there's right there is one thing that one can do. Hostess, those are great foundational, you know, action items to consider. And you know what I think is interesting, and I know a lot of listeners aren't going to like this because plastic water bottles, I know there's this attachment and what are the guests going to think? A guest may not realize if it's not in the room, even a guest that's not looking for sustainability nowadays, when they walk in and notice a water bottle. Now you are associated with that. Something that's faux pas. I mean, I hate to say it, but it is. And nowhere in any luxury experience, yes, we want all segments of hospitality to be able to offer sustainability. But let's take luxury, for example. No luxury experience does ever, anyone ever couple that with a plastic anything, right? <laughs> so it's really, it's about brand reputation. So um, really, really powerful things that people can do. All right. So I just want to touch on one last thing because I think this is so amazing. This is one of your, one of your most recent initiatives. Um, but you met with president Obama in 2019, and that led to the launch of the blue climate initiative, which you are a co-founder of. And it's really about tackling and figuring out how can travel, um, how can we balance travel and climate action together, uh, which are sometimes two things that people think don't go hand in hand, but they certainly do. So will you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the Blue Climate Initiative um, is primarily based in that particular, and then I'll come to your question about can we really travel and be climate sensitive? What What, what is this? the end of travel. We'll come to that in a second. But the Blue Climate Initiative is particularly focused on, you know, the vast majority of tourism happens in coastal destinations, not all of it, but the world's majority of tourism happens to be in the beach areas. You have the Caribbean, number one in the world, you have the Mediterranean, number two, and so on and so forth. But this is about areas that are countries that border the ocean, our island communities, our coastal communities, California, New Jersey, for that matter, Florida, et cetera. And it is how we can use science to ensure that we are reducing our carbon footprint and seeking net carbon neutrality or carbon positive impacts. The uh, location for a lot of the initial work we did on that uh, initiative, which is flourishing, uh, and we actually have a board meeting on Monday coming. Uh, so whichever day of the week it is, you can just pretend if you're a listener, it's this Monday. But at any rate, um, in which we'll be talking further. But a lot of the action on this has happened in the Pacific, uh, hence the connection with Obama. You know, he grew up in Hawaii. And I'll give you an example of just how innovation potentially can change the world. The Brando Resort in Tahiti. Now, Marlon Brando, you know, most people know him about his acting and that, but he was very obsessed with this concept of protecting ancient cultures, but also sustainability. And he dreamed of having a resort one day that would embrace all of that. He never lived long enough for it to happen. But the Brando Resort today is real. And we piloted quite a number of initiatives there uh, in relation to this. And I'll tell you about one of them, which is called deep sea water cooling. And I won't get technical, I'll make it real fast. The Brando today is the only resort in the world that 
provides air con well there's another one that they co-own so it's in their family and it's in uh uh Morea. um so or Bora Bora so um using coconut oil as a renewable energy fuel and supplementing that with solar energy is using deep cold water ocean and running it through an entire resort of 36 villas, air conditioning without any uh, fluorocarbons, which are particularly dangerous for the atmosphere. That's the refrigerating ingredients in air conditioning and so on. And doing it with renewable energy. So this concept of providing air conditioning in a sustainable way, in a renewable way, is pretty significant. So what's happened? Now, the city of Honolulu in Hawaii, downtown, a whole city is looking at this technology, which grew out of a tourism resort in a sustainable tourism initiative to see if they could potentially air condition all of downtown Honolulu's buildings off grid or certainly without what we call fluorocarbons, which are these very, very nasty uh, gases that are leading to climate change. So my point is just to say, here's an innovation that grew from a, a tourism resort that now has real world uh, possibilities. So the Blue Climate Initiative is about science, it's about innovation, and it's about looking at alternatives and how we can uh, you know, drive sustainability forward and address and reduce our global carbon footprint. Meanwhile, there's the other question you just asked, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, which is, Kostas, we hear a lot about climate and travel. And there have been people who are saying, don't get on a plane. You should not travel. You are bad if you do that. You know, and to a certain extent, there have been protests over this. So I'll give you an example. When Heathrow opened Terminal 5, the new terminal, there were massive demonstrations, people trying to block access up. And I got phone calls like, you need to speak out on this. And I said, do you really want me to speak out on this? Because I might not be speaking in the way you think. They know I'm an ardent conservationist. And my point was the following. And I don't know if you or readers have seen this, uh, but I published a piece in the New York Times uh, right before the pandemic. It appeared, I think, in December of 2019, addressing this issue. And this is my point. It's not to give a free pass to the airline industry. I mean, trust me, I've been at their gatherings in Europe and elsewhere, the International Aviation Association. They see me coming, they try to lock the doors. They don't want to get him out of here. I mean, like I've, I've been through this because I pressure them. But the, the reality is right now, three things to think about as travelers. One, we learned in the pandemic, and I used to say this before the pandemic, what would happen if we turned off tourism? What if literally we grounded every plane in the world? It's a rhetorical, in a way, it's a counterintuitive question. Will we have just saved the planet or will we have unleashed the global conservation nightmare? You know, it's always save the planet. The answer is global conservation nightmare. What? What do you mean? What is that? How is that possible? Okay. The airline industry today is responsible for approximately 5 to 7% of global emissions. Okay. That's enough. That's a problem. They got to get their act together. They, they constantly fall back on that statistic, kind of like, well, we're not that bad. Well, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing something about it. They need to do something about it. If we juxtapose that with deforestation right now, okay, there are three great global wilderness areas left that are basically the heart of our planet. The island of Papua New Guinea, great 
old growth forest, the Amazon basin, and the central African Congo basin. Those are the last three great tropical forests on earth. They are our lungs, okay? Deforestation accounts now for approximately one quarter, 25%, between 22 and 25% of all carbon emissions. So if we think about that, we're screaming and yelling and trying to shut down the global aviation industry. We should be yelling off our rooftops, stop cutting our forests, stop it. That is the greatest threat. One quarter of CO2 emissions driving climate change are coming from the cutting of our forests. And that's before even addressing things like I see in your picture, a young orangutan on your bookcase there because their habitat is being destroyed in the island of New Guinea. So we have got to stop cutting global forests. Full stop, end of discussion. And if we're gonna scream and yell, let us take the biggest shot at the biggest culprit that is driving climate change. That's one side of it. The other side of it is this. We talked about the Serengeti briefly earlier. The Serengeti park fees are just shy of $100. That's just to get into the park. And then, of course, uh, let me just cut to the chase. In one year of 2019, okay, the most recent statistics, we're starting to get new statistics now. <clears throat> Serengeti alone brought in over a billion dollars, all right? If we were to tell people, do not get on a plane and fly to the Serengeti, with, I would, in all my experience, wager, if not guarantee, that within five years, we will see the end of the last great migration on our planet. It's the only one we got left. The great wildebeest migration, 2.2 million animals migrating over a large ecosystem. We obliterated our buffalo, the caribou are down to a scratch, the antelope migrations of the Mongolian steppes are a fraction of what they used to be. This is it. This is our last great land migration. The Serengeti will be cattle farms in an instant. So the goal isn't to stop travel, it's to get it right. And if we really want to make a dent on climate change, then we have got to stop cutting global forests, as well as move on all these other fronts, plastic and everything else. It's not a one fix situation. But in my view, going and saying that our biggest problem is somebody from New York flying to Africa to see the Serengeti and providing jobs for millions of people that are facing poverty, we would plunge an entire continent into poverty that tourism is helping to address and then hand it over to the mining industry who would come in next. So already the Serengeti, they tried to, they, they tried to put a uh, major highway through the Serengeti for a train route, uh, Chinese government and Tanzanian government. And I wrote a hard hitting article on that uh, and basically gave the you know email addresses and contacts for key people in the Tanzanian government. And this was published in National Geographic and told readers, now's the time, shout, stop this. They were inundated and they stopped that railway track right at the border of the Serengeti. So my point is just simply this, we have to continue to do everything possible to reduce our carbon footprint, but to stop travel right now is actually going to unleash a biodiversity conservation nightmare. We are losing species left and right. And it's got to stop. Over 50% of the world's species have been lost in the last 100 years. And it's exhilarating. Tourism is one of the few things in many of the most remote parts of our planet that gives an economic justification to governments, such as in the country of Gabon, where they took 13 million acres that were in mining and timber concessions and created 11 new national parks after a compelling argument was made, and I was in the room saying, here's your options. Your great-grandchildren can have a great future in this country and continue to derive livelihoods for tourism 
or you can have a big party for the next 50 years and cut your forest and mine your ground and then you're done and you're finished. What do you want to do? So that's kind of how I see it. And it, and it makes a lot of sense. I think it's hard sometimes for people in other parts of the country to understand that. But, you know, I think I I like to look at it as like we just have to start being much more intentional and conscious about the way we're looking at our businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, rethinking waste, even hotels, like you're talking about chop chopping down forests. It's it's about where do we see opportunities, right? Rethinking, reusing things, um, and just getting creative. And um, I love the the ending on a note that we don't want in tourism. Um, no, we want to get it. We tra we want to get trying to get it right, I and that's what that. this is about. And I'll just say this final comment. Now, over this big arc of it's more than 30 years that I since those early days I talked to you about. The question is no longer can sustainable tourism work. There are hundreds of case studies. We know it works. We have the tools, we have the technology, the innovation's happening. The question is, is the will to make it work there? It's not. Is this possible? It is absolutely possible. The question is, will we rise to that challenge? Will we do it? That's what the travel industry is faced with today. And my response to them would be, you live and you celebrate nature and culture, whether that's a bistro on a Paris side street or whether it's tracking jaguars in a Costa Rican jungle. If that's your product, you better protect it. It, it. That is something great to end on because regardless of where you are in the world, if your natural ecosystem does not exist and your biodiversity does not exist, um, your business will not be there. Uh, and however many years, you know, God forbid that would be. So, well, we will end on that. And I want to thank you personally for, for all the work that you have done. Um, you personally inspired me to do what I'm doing today. Uh, and I get emotional because it's something I'm super passionate about and just really grateful for everything that you've done. I am immensely grateful to you and to the literally millions, tens of thousands, hundreds around the world every day who are interested in having these conversations and looking for ways to move forward. We can do this. Yes, I believe so too. This, I, I think we are in a pivotal time and we are going to see a lot of change happen. So um, have a great day wherever you are. And where are you, Thank by the you. way? <laughs> I'm in the country of Belize right now. Okay, okay. You're in Belize. I know you're always around. So enjoy the sunshine. Enjoy Belize. And Costas, we hope we get to talk to you again. And we can't wait to see all of the things that you do in the future. Thanks, Thank everyone, you. for tuning back into the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. And for more information on sustainable hospitality, please go to www.greenluxinc.com. Com. We will see you on our next episode. Thank you. We want to thank you for tuning back into the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. Keep the conversation going and visit the contact page at greenluxinc.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter where we will bring you the latest developments and breaking news in sustainable hospitality and tourism. That's www.greenluxeinc.com. And if you're ready to start your sustainability journey and would like some help on knowing what that could look like, book a complimentary call with us today. Until our next episode, remember, sustainability is your ticket to a healthier planet, and a healthier bottom line. Don't forget to like, 